Okay, happy Monday. Welcome back, guys. So let's get finished up with some surface area. I think we're going to do one more example here. So let's jump in. So our example is find the surface area integral of f dot ds where our vector field f is 3x, 2z, and 1 minus y squared. Oh no, it kind of gets cut off there, huh? Oh, no, it did still draw. OK. And S is the portion of Z equals 2 minus 3Y plus x squared that lies over the triangle in the xy plane that's detailed by the coordinates in the xy plane, 0, 0, 2, 0, and 2, negative 4, with negative Z axis orientation. Okay, so from surface area integrals, we kind of recalled that we needed to do our projection where we converted this ds to a da. Uh, and now we also have vector fields in this, right? So we're trying to look at um, f dot n, right? This is what this this relationship here means. So if you recall, uh, this is just a shorthand of writing the surface area integral of f dot n ds. So let's go ahead. So the g function, right? What is the behavior of our surface? Well, that's detailed by our z equation right here. So what we can do is say that g of x y and z is equal to z plus 3y minus x squared is equal to 2, right? We have a constant on that right-hand side. It's a perfect candidate for a g function. Now, it also says that we're lying above the triangle in the xy plane. So that gives us how the boundary of this surface works. So it makes sense for us to project to the xy plane because we have details on what that projection already looks like. So we're going to project to the triangle in the xy plane. So if we're going to the xy plane, we're letting p go in the z direction. So we have k hat. OK, step two. We need to look at what the projection looks like. So the projection is the surface that gets projected down to the xy plane, but we know that it lies over this triangle. So that triangle is our projection. So let's go ahead and do a sketch of that. So we have x, we have x and y. 
want to just scroll up a little bit. We said 0, 0, uh, 2, 0, and 2, negative 4. So it looks like we're in the majority. The fourth quadrant, so I'll do this. So we have x and y. Then we have the origin here, 0, 0. We also have 2, 0. And then we also have 2, negative 4. And then we'll just connect these with lines. So this is what our projection looks like. So we could call this R. So it might be good to find the equation for this hypotenuse now. So this is y is equal to negative 2x. So now for step three, we look at our gradient. So we have the gradient of g here, which is negative 2x, 3, 1. We'll also look at the magnitude of the gradient dotted with uh, p, which in this case was just k. So why don't we just go ahead and put a k there? So this is the z component, which is the absolute value of 1, which just ends up giving us 1. OK, so you remember for these vector surface area integrals, we, need, we either had the plus or the minus on this gradient. right? So we need to kind of figure out what is the correct normal to this surface? So if you look back at our problem statement, we say that this has a surface with negative z-axis orientation, meaning that the normal should be pointed in the negative z direction. Okay. So I look back at my gradient here, and this is pointing in the positive z direction. Right. So I probably want to choose the negative here to allow me to get the negative z direction on this normal. So here, the direction for out of the surface, this normal, is down. Which means we pick the negative gradient to detail our normal. So this is 2x negative 3 negative 1, right? And now this vector is always, it always has a negative z component. Perfect. So now during the same step, we'll go ahead and actually look at this dot product between our vector field f. We're dotting it with negative gradient of g. So we have 3x, 2z, 1 minus y squared, and we're dotting this with 2x, negative 3, and negative 1. This gives us 6x squared minus 6z minus 1 plus y squared. OK. So that gives us everything we need for the integrand. So step four, is because we're doing our integrals in the xy plane, we need to remove z with our constraint, this g function, which was that z equals 2 minus 3y plus x squared. So we had that f dot negative uh, gradient of g. It has the z in it. So we need to get rid of that. So this is 6x squared minus 6 times. We'll plug this in. So we get 2 minus 3y plus x squared minus 1 
plus y squared. Do a little bit of simplifying here. We end up with a y squared plus an 18y minus 13. So finally, we can do our surface area integral as an area integral. So we have surface area integral of f dot ds. So this becomes our area integral over r of f dotted with the negative gradient of g and then 1 over the magnitude of the gradient of g dotted with our p vector, which in this case was k hat dA. So we're doing this over the triangle. So we'll write out our integrals first and then our integrand. We found this right here. This is just our y squared plus 18y minus 13. And we found that the magnitude of this denominator here was just 1. All right, so we just end up with their antigram being y squared plus 18y minus 13. I'm going to choose to do dy dx for that triangle, which means that I go from negative 2x to 0, and then 0 to 2. So we can actually do this out. This goes from 0 to 2. And then we have 1 third y to the third plus 9y squared minus 13y evaluated at y equals negative, negative 2x and 0. We still have our x integral to do, so dx. So integral from 0 to 2. 8 thirds x cubed minus 36 x squared minus 26 x. dx. can do this out. This gives us 2 thirds x to the fourth minus 12 x cubed minus 13 x squared. And we're evaluating this at x equals 0 and x equals 2. To the end of the day gives us negative 4 12 over 3. Okay, so again, just to kind of reiterate, I know we, we talked a, a lot on Friday um, about you know, the surface area integrals. I wanted to just kind of warm us up again to these surface area integrals. The steps kind of follow. We're looking at where we're projecting that defines our P. With that, we can figure out what our projection looks like in that corresponding plane. Then we need to look at the gradient of G uh, the magnitude of the gradient of g dotted with that p vector for vectors. Um, if we're doing a just a non-vector uh, surface area integral, remember we also have to look at the, the gradient or the magnitude of the gradient of g. Um, then we have to figure out for the vector surface areas that for flux that we need to figure out the plus or the minus for the gradient of g. A lot of times I think that's easiest by trying to to kind of remind ourselves what is the direction that the normal is pointing in. Um, and it might not always be like so clean that we have a constant uh, in that particular direction. So here we have our gradient of G is just one. But in this case, it's, it's worked out nicely, right? This is pointed in the positive direction. And we know that it needed to be pointing down. So we just could easily flip it, and make this choose this negative. So just kind of use reasoning. There's not like a one tell-all that will uh, kind of help you out. So just kind of, there's no plug and chug for it. So you just have to kind of use a little bit of reasoning when you're looking at the normal direction. 
Um, and then we look at what the integrand is going to look like, right? We say we take our dot product and we also keep in mind what the, uh, the denominator is going to look like, the gradient uh, dotted with k in magnitude, right? And then we remove any of the variables that are in that corresponding or like not included in that coordinate plane. So here we were doing the x, y plane, so we removed all z's. Uh, but likewise, if you're doing, say, maybe the y, z, you remove x. And if you're doing the x, z, you remove y. Just that missing one. And then we can finally transform our surface area integral into an area integral, right? Just this double integral here. And we've gotten a lot of practice with that so far. Okay. So with that, surface area integrals are going to take a little bit. Actually, directly computing them is going to be taking a back seat while we jump, jump into the next section, which is the next big theorem. So we looked at Green's theorem, right? And that helped us convert line integrals that uh, have cl like they're closed line integrals, so they make a loop. Um, and they relate the line integral to a area integral of the thing that is included inside of that uh, closed uh, boundary. Right, so now we're going to learn something a little bit similar, but it's going to be in a higher dimension. So we're going to talk about Stokes' theorem. So for Stokes' theorem, what we're going to do is consider some surface that we'll call S in R3. There, there are some questions that are kind of coming through. I'll answer them uh, just in just one second uh, in R3. defined by z is equal to some function u of x and y. The surface S has the projection d onto the xy plane. If we were to define some vector field f with component functions p Let's just write them shorthand, P, Q, and R. OK, so lo let's look at the, the questions just to make sure I'm thinking about it correctly. When do you uh, do surface area integrals? You only calculate the surface area if the integrand is 1. Otherwise, you are adding up whatever function is on that surface. Right, so you can kind of think of if you it's the same as doing an area or a volume, right? If you wanted to know strictly what the volume is and you're doing a triple integral, the integrand will be one. If you wanted to find out the area of a region uh, using a double integral, you could, use, you could just say the integrand is one, right? Uh, same thing, if you want to know the surface area of some surface, the integrand will be one. But a more physical meaning to say having a an integrand that is not necessarily one could be I'm trying to find the mass on a surface and I'm given some density that has units, uh, mass per unit surface area, right? So you would be adding up all of the small masses along that surface and then creating a one big mass, right? So if you want to find just the surface area, integrand is one, if you're doing a surface area integral. Uh, if you wanted to do uh, something else, uh, if your anagram is not necessarily one, maybe you're also calculating flux, not just uh, mass. 
So you're turning it into a vector form, right? You're going to have an integram that is that is non one. Uh, which section of the book is this? Uh, I think this corresponds to 13.8. Yeah, we jump where we don't go exactly in order because we we had some things like divergence and curl that I wanted to kind of discuss uh, ahead of time. But now I think we're we're kind of back on track to how the ordering of the book is. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so now we have this f function, this vector field here. And observe So we're going to do a surface area integral. And we're going to do specifically a flux. But we're going to look at the flux of the curl of f. So imagine this is a new vector, right? And then I'm finding the flux of that new vector through the surface s. Right, so in order for us to do that, we could write this as a projection. Right, we can turn this into a area integral. So we have our integral over the region D, because we said that once we project to the XY plane, S has a projection D. Then we have to calculate what this cross product is. This is partial R partial y minus partial q, partial z. Might not have left myself enough room here. We have partial p, partial z, minus partial r, partial x, partial q, partial x, minus partial p, partial y. That's that cross product there. And remember, we're dotting this with the normal that we have not found yet, this just n vector. And then we have the gradient of g in magnitude divided by the magnitude of the gradient of g dotted with k hat, because we are projecting to the x, y plane here. So if we were projecting to, say, a different coordinate plane, we would have to just change this to that. We could just call it p. But very specifically, we are projecting to the x, y plane. OK, so we can write the flux of the curl of f as this. And then, of course, we've learned about how to do this with surface area integrals. We can convert this to an area integral. It's just this double. So what is this g function? Well, we said here that x, or sorry, that z is equal to u, uh, a function of x and y. Um, and sorry, not since, we'll say with g of x, y, and z being equal to z minus the function u of x and y is equal to 0, right? Because we can move over that function, and then we're equal to a constant on the right-hand side. We can also recall that the normal vector was plus or minus the gradient of g over the magnitude of the gradient of g. So since the gradient of g is equal to negative u, the, the x derivative of u, and then minus u y, 1, then the normal times the gradient of g in magnitude divided by the gradient of g dotted with k hat in magnitude is equal to plus or minus negative ux, negative uy, 1. 
So we just took care of this whole segment right here, this n times uh, our ratio of the magnitudes of the gradient of g and the gradient of g dotted with k. So just kind of um, arbitrarily here, what we're going to do is we choose that n is going to be pointing up. So if we have that it's pointed up, this means choose the positive version. All right, so we'll choose the positive so that our z component is uh, positive, which is pointing up. So if that's the assumption that we make, what ends up happening is that surf the flux of the curl of F written as a area integral still over the region D. But now what we can actually do is that we can actually do out that dot product now. So we get negative, and this is, this is going to be a big mouthful here. We have partial R, partial Y, minus partial Q partial z, uh, partial u, partial x, oh, not comma, it's a subtraction, a quantity partial p, partial z, minus partial r, partial x, times partial u, partial y, and then we have plus partial q, partial x, minus partial p, partial y. We end our bracket here, and then we have dA. Where each uh, partial of P, Q, and R is evaluated at X, Y, and U of X, Y, right? Because just like a surface area integral, we would have to eliminate that Z. And we know that Z is equal to U. So we're just making sure that whenever we do these evaluations, we would uh, plug in u for z. OK, so for the surface area integral, we're going to stop here. Right? This is just some form. Uh, and now what we're going to do is, so now s has some curve. in R3 that we'll call C and maybe a subscript S that defines its boundary. So this is a surface area, right? It still has a like an, a termination edge to it. And we can call that edge, uh, describe it parameter, uh, parametrically through a curve that we'll call C sub S, right? So the difference between um, greens was we had some area that had a boundary, right? That boundary was always in the same plane, right? Here, this is a curve uh, in R3. Right, so presumably it has, it's not just on some plane, it just is some kind of terminal edge for this surface. <clears throat> the projection D also has a boundary.
curve called CD. Both of these curves can have parametric representations. So for the boundary of the surface, CS, what we'll do is we'll say that x is some function of t. We'll have that y is some function of t. And then z is u with x of t and y of t inputted. And we'll have that t runs from uh, a to b. Now the curve that is the boundary for the projection, very similar. We'll have a parameterization for x. We'll have a parameterization for y. But now because we're in the xy plane, we have that z is just equal to 0 here. So what we're going to do we're going to look at the closed line integral over cs remember this is the boundary for the surface of f dot dr so we're doing line integrals so we can do our parameterization this goes from A to B of P dx dt plus Q dy dt plus R dz dt dt. And presumably, we're changing. Um, Wherever we have an x, y, or z, we're putting this in terms of t for the component functions of our uh, vector field f. So these are functions of x, y, and z, but we're, we're, we're inputting our parameterization there. But we have that dz dt is equal to d dt of g of x of t, y of t, which gives us partial u, partial x, dx dt, plus partial u, partial y, dy dt. All right, so there's that, that chain rule coming in. So what we could do is rewrite our line integral as the integral from a to b of p plus r partial u partial x dx dt plus q plus r partial u partial y dy dt dt. So all we did is just substitute uh, this dz dt in, and we just group terms with the dx dt and the dy dt. OK, so why did we group it this way? Well, remember, when we were doing parameterizations, this was the this is the, the dx dt times this dt is it the dx, 
right? And then dy dt times this dt is just the dy. So what we could do is write this as another line integral. But notice here that we've removed all z's from this expression, which ends up being the closed line integral on the curve of the projection. This is p plus r partial u partial x dx plus q plus r partial u partial y dy. So what we've done is we've turned the line integral over the boundary of s into a line integral over the boundary of d. Now, we know things about how to translate a line integral from uh, a boundary of an area, right? We can, we can use greens to get us there. So you might see like the, we're starting to build the, the foundation for some equivalents for a surface area to a line integral. So now we've got to do a lot of partial work on these. And luckily, we only have to do this once, and then we can start using the theorem. So now, since the curve CD encloses D, we can use Green's theorem. to convert this to an area integral. Over the region D. So recall that if I had the line integral over some uh, closed curve C, and I had A dx plus B dy, I could write this as the area integral over the enclosed region D of partial B partial x minus partial A partial y da. So just a review of Green's theorem. So if we look back up at what we have, we can write down what we have for a and b. So we have in this case a is p plus r partial u partial x and we have that b is equal to q plus r partial u partial y. So if we wanted to convert this line integral to this uh, area integral, it looks like we're going to have to take the partial derivatives with respect to y and respect to x, respectively, of this a and b. So that's, what's <laughs> that's what we need to do now. So a lot of partial work here. Well, let's also keep in mind that z is equal to u of x and y. Let's start with partial b, partial x. This is partial x of q plus partial x of r times partial z partial y, we've just substituted in uh, z for u here, plus r partial x of partial z partial y. So we had to use a product rule on that second term. Okay. 
OK, this is partial q, partial x, partial x, partial x, plus partial q, partial z, partial z, partial x, plus partial z, partial y of the quantity, partial r, partial x, partial x, plus partial r, partial z, partial z, <laughs> partial x, plus r, the second derivative of z, x, y. So why did we have to do, um, you might be asking why we had to do this chain rule here. But remember, q, r are both functions of x, y, and z. But z is inherently a function of x and y. So that's why we see uh, this uh, chain rule here for both of them. OK. Let's simplify this just a little bit. This is partial q. Partial x, partial x, partial x just is 1. And then we have partial q, partial z, times partial z, partial x, plus partial r, partial x, partial z, partial y. Just gonna <laughs> rest my voice here for a second. There's a lot of partials. So that is partial B, partial X. Now you, now you know what I said, that we had to do a lot of partial work here. OK. Um, I'm just going to skip to what partial A, partial X is, or no, sorry, uh, partial Y, partial A, partial Y. So you have to do a very similar setup. You can again. You'd have to use the the chain rule. I promise it gets better. <laughs> it's going to simplify. OK, so there's our partial A, partial Y. So very sim similar setup. We'd have to use the chain rule, product rule. Uh, and they actually share a lot of common terms. And remember, in Green's theorem, we have to look at their subtraction. So we're looking at partial B, partial X, subtracting. Uh, partial A and partial Y. Well, that simplifies out to our partial R, partial X minus partial P, partial Z, partial Z, partial Y, plus partial Q, partial Z, minus partial r, partial y, 
our partial z, partial x. plus a partial q, partial x, minus a partial p, partial y. So then, by Green's theorem, I have that the line integral of the curve that is the border for this surface, f dot dr, is equal to the area over the region that we're uh, projecting to for the surface s is negative partial r, partial y, minus partial q, partial z, partial z, partial x, minus partial p, partial z, minus partial r, partial x, dz, oh, no, partial, partial z, partial y plus partial q, partial x, partial p, partial y, dA. Oh my goodness, so many partials. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a second to uh, just scribble that down. I know it was a lot. <laughs> But now, uh, if you can look at your notes above, and I'll screw up in just a second, I'll just give you guys a little bit of time to write this down. This actually lined up with the uh, surface area integral that we were doing. Remember the curl of F. So we were looking at the flux of the curl of F as a surface area integral, and we converted it to an area integral. This is what we had. So Stokes' theorem in a very clean sense. So let's actually kind of just scroll up here. So we had this, we'll, we'll scroll back down. Um, oh, so much, we have to <laughs> look at all this. And then we had all the way past our parameterization. This is what we had for our, uh, the flux of the curl of F. So Stokes theorem, really cleanly written without all of this nonsense. Thus, the final result is that the closed line integral of the boundary of some surface S, F dot dr, is equal to the surface area integral that calculates the flux of the curl of F. And that's Stokes' theorem. So whereas Green's theorem converted a uh, area integral, or this is vice versa, you can have a line integral and convert it into an area integral over the uh, enclosed region, or vice versa, Stokes' theorem is the generalization of that to a higher dimension, where I now have a line integral that encloses a surface, right? And I can equate that to the flux of the curl of F. Okay, Whew. why don't we take our five minute break here? Uh, so go get a drink of water, go use the restroom, and then we'll jump into an example where we're gonna prove uh, for a particular surface that both sides of this are the, the same quantity. All right, so let's do take a five minute break and be right back. Okay, so we derived Stokes' theorem. We did it. Now we don't have to do that again. So let's look at an example 
where we're not going to actually enact Stokes' theorem, but we are going to brute force calculate the left-hand side and the right-hand side and see that they are equivalent. So just get some extra practice with line integrals and surface area integrals. And then later on, we'll do some examples for actually enacting this. So prove that Stokes' theorem holds true to the hemisphere x squared plus y squared plus c squared is equal to 9 where we have that z is non-negative, so z is uh, greater than or equal to zero. And the field f is equal to y negative x zero. So when it says we're, pr we're proving that it holds true, we just need to calculate the left-hand side. We actually need to do out that line integral. Uh, and then we'll also look at the right-hand side and look at that surface area integral. So let's start with the line integral. So just kind of a reminder, this isn't taking advantage of Stokes' theorem. This is just showing that it holds true for this specific thing, right? When in practicality, you wouldn't, do, you wouldn't do both sides of this. You would have trouble either doing the line or the surface area integral, and you could convert them. So the boundary of the hemisphere is where the surface area terminates, right? So if you think about the sphere, so let's actually kind of do maybe like a two-dimensional drawing here. I can just use a, a circle here. We have some hemisphere, and we decide that we're cutting it at z equals 0. The termination or the boundary of the surface is I think I still have line set up. There we go. And I'm not even selected the draw tool. There we go. Is so if I have so you know, some, you know, I cut this like that, that is the boundary of the hemisphere, is where that hemisphere stops due to it being cut. So this is in the xy plane conveniently. And we know that this is a sphere of radius 3. So on that plane where z is equal to 0, we know that this is a circle of radius 3. Right? So this is the expression in the z equals 0 plane, so the xy plane, that uh, is the boundary of our surface, the boundary of our hemisphere. So if that's what I need to parameterize, uh, parameterize, eh, can't talk, parameterize. Nope, still can't do it. <laughs> We're going to parameterize. There we go. It was all those partials. I said too many partials. I got just a little bit of water. will help. So we have R of T. I'm going to choose, this is just one parameterization for, uh, x squared plus y squared is equal to 9, is 3 cosine t, 3 sine t. And remember, since we're still in R3, we do need, it's very important that we have a z component here. We do know that this is in z equals 0 plane. So z is equal to 0 here. And 
I have that t goes from 0 to 2 pi. And you can double check that that makes the, uh, the boundary here, the x squared plus y squared is equal to 9, and the uh, z equals 0 plane. OK. So then I'm also going to need to find out what dr is. So that is just the first derivative uh, times a dt. So this is negative 3 sine of t, 3 cosine of t, and 0 dt. All right, that's just the first derivative. You just move over that dt. So when I look at f, dot dr. This is 3 sine of t. I have to plug in my parameterization uh, for my vector field f. So that was a y. And then we had a negative x, which will be negative 3 cosine of t, 0, dotted with our dr, which was negative 3 sine of t, 3 cosine of t, 0 dt. So we can do this dot product out. We get negative 9 sine squared of t minus 9 cosine squared of t plus 0 dt. We have, we have the same coefficient out in front of our sine squared and our cosine squared, lucky for us. So this simplifies really nicely to just negative 9 dt. So our line integral over c of f dot dr is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi Remember, those are the bounds for our parameter t, negative 9 dt. That is a very nice integral to do. This is just negative 18 pi. OK, so that wasn't too bad. Let's do the area integral, or more specifically, the surface area integral. Hopefully math works and we get negative 18 pi. So for this, we're going to start off by calculating the curl of f. So we have i hat, j hat, and k hat. We have our partials y, negative x, and 0. So for x uh, component, we're looking at the determinant here. Uh, so this is partial y of 0 minus partial z of x. That's just 0. Then we have, um, for our j component, or the y component here, we have the determinant of partial x with 0. Uh, minus partial z of y, and we're taking the negative of that. But luckily, negative of 0 is still 0. And then for our z component, we're looking at partial x of negative x. So that's negative 1. And then I'm subtracting partial y of y. So that's also, we're subtracting 1. So we have a negative 1 minus, uh, minus 1. So it looks like this is just negative 2 k hat. This little compact way of writing it there. So now, this is the vector field that we're trying to find the flux of. So we can go through all of our steps. Um, so our projection
So if we want to kind of consider where we want to project to, we know if we look directly above the sphere onto the xy plane, it just looks like a circle of radius 3. So this is us looking down uh, onto the sphere. So this, this is what the projection looks like. So we probably want to choose to go to the xy plane. So step one, project to xy plane, which means that our p vector is k hat. Um, we actually haven't even <laughs> said what our g function is yet, uh, so maybe we'll do that now. So our g function, remember, is the behavior of the surface, not necessarily where the boundary is, right? And from that, we know it behaves like the sphere of radius 3. So that's x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 9, right? So that's our g function. We've already done step two. This is our projection to the xy plane. So we'll just write step two. I'm doing this a little bit of out of order, but that's OK. It doesn't always need to be exactly in order. Step three is let's go ahead and look at the gradient of g. 2x, 2y. 2z. So here we'll also kind of decide where the, the positive needs or like where the uh, if we're choosing the plus or the minus. So um, this is the first instance that we have to kind of discuss um, the like the orientation of our lines. Um, so when When we're, this certainly matters more when we're doing the inverse, when we're going from the surface to the, the uh, line integral. But we have to use the right hand rule. If you remember way back when the right hand rule told us uh, where the cross product needed to be, to be pointing. Um, and so if you stick your right hand out <laughs> and we decide that the normal is going to be our thumb, and this is pointing out of the sphere. Um, the fingers will curl in the orientation that we need the line integral to be going in. So this is more important for doing the inverse. Um, so what we've done is we've actually decided prior that our, uh, our line was going counterclockwise. So that means if you put your right hand out and you go counterclockwise with your, with your fingers and you curl it, the thumb is pointing out. It's pointing in the positive z direction, right? So we need this to be pointed in the positive z direction. And we look here. And remember that z for the surface is non-negative. So this last component here is always positive. So we should choose the positive for our gradient. We also need to calculate the gradient of g dotted with k hat in magnitude. So this gives us the absolute value of 2z. This is also important because uh, we said that we were looking at when z is non-negative. So this thing will never have a negative value. So the absolute values can be dropped, and we can just write 2z. That's helpful. And then we can also look 
at our the vector field that we're considering the flux of, which was the curl of f that we calculated earlier. And we're dotting this with the, uh, the gradient of g. And we're choosing the positive. <clears throat> and uh, just for convenience, we'll also divide by the gradient of g dotted with k hat and throw in our da here. So what is this full integrand? Well, we said that this was negative 2 k hat. And now we're dotting it with the vector that's 2x, 2y, 2z. That's being divided by 2z everywhere. So this will be x over z, y over z, and 1 da. This will just give us negative 2, because we're only looking, because this has 0 in the x and the y position. So this is just negative 2 da. That is a very nice integrand. We don't even have to worry about step 4, because there, <laughs> there aren't any z's. Um, so now, because of our projection being a circle, I'm going to consider polar coordinates. So let's just put our step four. We didn't have to worry about that. Our integrand's really nice. Didn't have to do any substitutions. And step five was our surface area integral calculating the flux of the curl of F. You can write this as the area integral over D the curl of f dotted with the gradient of g over the gradient of g dotted with k hat da. Well, this is 0 to 3, 0 to 2 pi negative 2 times r dr d theta. Um, I think I missed this, but why is 2z always positive? Since it is a sphere centered at the origin, aren't there negative values? Uh, there are not because of the problem statement. The problem statement said that we were only looking at the top half of the hemisphere. So we had that z was non-negative there. Um, <clears throat> we, we actually needed this to determine what the edge of our boundary was. If we didn't uh, say that z is uh, less than, or sorry, greater than or equal to 0, we actually won't have a boundary for the surface. This, the closed sphere is a closed surface, which we'll talk about at another point. But the, the region that, the, so the region, or the reason that there is a boundary to the surface in the first place is that we, we cut it with the plane uh, z equals zero. Okay, so now we're back to our double integral here. But notice if I we could do this double integral out, but remember we're getting we're getting used to being engineers here. So if I moved the constant out, this negative uh, two outside of the integral, um, I this would be just calculating the area of the region D. So this is equal to negative two times the area of the circle. which will give us negative 18 pi. And it lines up. <laughs> That's what we got for the line integral. We did it. Math still works. We got negative 18, on 18 pi on the left-hand side, and we got negative 18 pi on the right-hand side. Now, you can argue, argue which one was simpler and which one you're more comfortable with. So let's say 
you had to do, you had the setup for doing this line integral and potentially maybe the line integral is really hard to do. You could convert that into the surface air integral that calculates the flux of the curl. Uh, likewise, uh, calculating the flux of the curl over a surface um, shows up in different fields that might be hard to calculate by you know, brute forcing it. So instead, you can invoke Stokes theorem and you could calculate the line integral instead. So now we're on. Ah, OK. Yeah, so now we're going to be talking about. Let's kind of just put a break right here. And then we'll say we consider two surfaces. with the same curve C. So the same boundary curve, to be precise. From Stokes' theorem, oh, forgot. We have that the flux of the curl through surface one is equal to the closed line integral over the curve C of F dot dr. Right? That's just Stokes theorem. And if we have a second surface that also shares the same boundary, C, could also look at the flux of the curl for that surface. And using Stokes' theorem, we can write that as the closed line integral over C dot dr. But now both of these expressions have the same right-hand side which means that their left-hand side should be equal. So I can say the surface area integral over surface one of the flux of the curl for surface one is the same as the flux of the curl through surface two. So this is only possible through Stokes theorem. So if you're calculating the flux of a normal uh, vector field where you just have f dot ds, this doesn't work, right? Stokes theorem says it has to be the curl, sorry, the flux of the curl, right? So I have my, my curls in these integrands. This is the only time that we can invoke uh, Stokes theorem like this. So don't get confused that we, ca we can't do this for any general uh, surface. It just has to be the uh, flux of the curl. But what this means is that if I am trying to calculate the flux of the curl and I have some really elaborate surface, what I could do is instead pick a new surface that shares the same boundary curve C um, and then do that surface integral instead. So let's look back to our last example, right? If we were trying to do this problem again, and I wanted to calculate the surface area integral of this hemisphere, rather than do it on the hemisphere itself and project down, what I could do is choose a new surface that has the same boundary. Well, the boundary of the hemisphere was just the uh, perimeter of, of a circle of radius three in the xy plane. The plane z equals zero that's cut off by uh, that circle x squared plus y squared is equal to nine is a perfect surface. So the surface 
z equals zero with x squared plus y squared less than or equal to nine shares the same C as the hemisphere. So what would happen if I wanted to calculate that surface area integral? Well, the flux of the curl for this dot ds. So remember, we're converting this to an area integral. Um, <clears throat> so over the region D. If I have a surface area integral <laughs> that is already a plane, it's, you can just express that as an area integral, right? It is, it is the surface area, is just the normal area, right? Because it's just a flat surface. So first off, we have we knew that the curl was 0, 0, negative 2. That's what we calculated earlier. The n vector, the normal, is just 0, 0, 1, right? We know that, know that the normal vector just points directly upward, um, dA. Right? So we can do this dot product out. And in fact, we're, this is just the circle of radius 3. So we can just write this as the integral from 0 to 2 pi and 0 to 3. We do that dot product out. We get negative 2 r dr d theta. And we get negative 18 pi. That, to me, is a lot easier. <laughs> Right? I don't even need to worry about projecting in this case, right? because the surface area is, in fact, just a flat plane. So I can just do an area integral of it. And we've seen that before. right? If we were trying to do a surface area integral over a plane, uh, that, or just a, yeah, a plane that happens on a coordinate plane, the projection is itself. Right? And it just becomes an area integral. Uh, so we have our curl of f dotted with our n which we could just intuitively, intuitively write 0, 0, 1, because we know that it has to be directly pointed up, uh, dA. And then we just get the same um, polar coordinate integral, and we can do that over again. We get negative 18 pi. Pretty cool. <laughs> we can do the surface area integral over a hand-picked surface rather than um, the current surface, as long as we're looking at the uh, the flux of the curl. Remember, that's the only time that this holds true for. And that's pretty convenient. Because most of the time, if we're looking at a complex surface, we can always choose our hand-picked surface to be a plane that shares the same boundary as long as the boundary itself exists on a plane. And that's not always true, right? You can have some fluctuations that the uh, such that the, the boundary curve doesn't necessarily belong all to the same plane. Um, then we can't, we could still pull this off, but the hand-picked surface might be more difficult to find. OK. So why don't we talk about one last thing, and then we'll pick up tomorrow. So we're going to talk about ooh, got my pen upside down. Conservative fields and Stokes theorem. So we've seen these conservative fields pop in and out of our uh, material lately. So the whole definition of the, uh, the vector field F being conservative was that it was possible for us to write um, that it could either be 
that the curl of f is equal to zero, or the it could be expressed as the gradient of a scalar function f. So f is conservative. One way to say that this was true was that the curl of f is equal to zero, the zero vector. Or another way to say this was that it was possible for us to write, ooh, not g, although that, I guess that would work, is that we could express the vector field as uh, the vector field that's generated by taking the gradient of a scalar function uh, f. So if we were to look at the line integral over some c of f dot dr, where f is conservative, what we could do is enact Stokes' theorem. So we can instead look at the surface area integral that calculates the flux of the curl of f. But if f is conservative, then we know that this, is, this quantity is just the zero vector. That's one definition of f being conservative, right? So if I add up <laughs> all these elements where I'm adding zero, I'm going to end up with zero. So this means that the line integral over some closed region C is equal to zero if F is conservative. But funny enough, we used this uh, when we were talking about the fundamental theorem of line integrals. We used this fact. And I said that we were going to get around and prove that it was true. Um, like, when did we, when was this uh, possible? When would I have that the line integral over some closed curve is equal to zero, regardless of the curve, C? We, we just happened to say that, oh, this is only true when f is conservative. And here it is. Here's the proof. We needed Stokes' theorem to kind of get us there. So we keep seeing conservative fields pop in and out. Uh, but here it is once again for, for Stokes' theorem. OK, um, we have a few minutes left. I can stick around. But uh, I don't have anything else that I want to say today. We're just going to pick up tomorrow and finish up Stokes' theorem. Um, we're going to do some actual examples where we utilize it. And then all we have left to do is 13.9. Uh, so we are a little bit ahead of schedule. Good, <laughs> because that means that that was kind of the plan, hopefully, um, because this material is a little bit more difficult, of course, than the, the rest of the course. So I would like to kind of try to do some review closer to the end. Um, I, I do have some, some review slides that we could go through, um, as well as uh, maybe we'll have time for, to go through a practice exam that's not on the archive together. We'll see how far we get. Um, but until then, I'll, I'm going to stick around and answer some questions if you have any. But if you don't, then you're free to go. And I will see you tomorrow. Stay safe.